to the meeting of the FRAC committee. Have we got any apologies for absence? Uh, yes, apologies for absence have been received from Assemblymember Cooper. Thank you. Uh, main item today is a discussion on firefighting in a modern city. Can I make sure everybody's got their electronic devices switched to silent? Uh, members of the public may want to follow at London Assembly on Twitter and use the hashtag AssemblyFire for this meeting. Um, can I ask members to note the list of offices on the report and ask if they have any additional interest to declare? Noted. Thank you. Uh, can we agree the minutes of the meeting on the 18th of July? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can we note the completed list, uh, uh, note the completed and ongoing actions? Noted. Thank you. Can we note the recent action taken by me and the delegated authority to agree the committee's response to the government consultation, building a safer future, proposals for reform of the building safety regulation system? And can we also note the response to the consultation submission from Robert Jenrick, MP, Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government? Noted. Noted. Thank you. Which brings us to the main item for today, the discussion on firefighting in a modern city. So can I welcome our guests, uh, Dr Fiona Twycross, Deputy Mayor, Fanny Cotton, Commissioner, Dan Daly, Assistant Commissioner, Sue Bennon, Director of Corporate Services, Tim Powell, Assistant Director of People Services, and Steve White, Acting Executive Council Member from the FBU. Okay, so perhaps we can make a start, and I'll um, kick off. The family page. So, first question to the Commissioner, how's the nature of fire changing in London? So I think it's a really timely question uh, and really welcome the opportunity to talk about some of the, uh, what we consider to be risks and opportunities in London at the moment. I think that we all recognise that currently issues around building safety is something that's at the forefront of all of our minds. Um, as you be aware that we've had several large-scale incidents in the very recent months in London highlighting the issues we have around building safety. And I think that you know, London will always be at the forefront of a lot of these issues, not least of all because we are the capital city and we have the largest building stock, but because we will always be subject to all kinds of new developments. Um, and I think that in seeing the amount of building that is going on in London at the moment, and seeing the fact that when we're attending some of these incidents in newly constructed buildings, we are recognising there are different risks that we are facing now. And a lot of these are concerns we have around the building safety programme itself, because some of the uh, fires that we've seen recently, we've seen that buildings just aren't behaving in the way that we hoped they would, and that the methods of construction might not be as robust, and the inspection regime might not be as robust as we might wish it to be. Overlaid that with the other you know, topics that we see regularly, so increasing in flooding, increasing in grass fires, obviously the ever-present threat of terrorism where London will always be a key target. It's important to me that London Fire Brigade is not only ready and prepared, but is trained and looking forward to the future for new ways in which we can anticipate might what be coming down the line, but make sure that we have the right training and development in place to address those issues. Okay. And following on from that, how, how is fire rescue and fire safety changing as a result of all those developments? So I think for me, um, one of the things that's changing is that, you know, clearly we've been doing a lot of work focusing on actually doing a lot more fire safety and the prevention work and protection work, which I think is a key role for firefighters going forward. As you're aware, you know, we want response to be the last resort. We want to have done the work behind the scenes to make sure that we carry on reducing fires. We've shown some fantastic reductions in numbers, both of primary fires um, and dwelling fires, but also secondary fires as well. And I think that work needs to continue. We're doing an education plan at the moment for our firefighters to make sure that they are trained and aware of the risks and when they're out doing their everyday visits and inspections, that they're equipped with the right information. But for me, a lot of it is around the work that Dan and his team are doing around issues around building construction, modern methods of construction. But it isn't just about modern methods. We've seen some of the building fires where we've had complexities and issues with no fire stopping, some of these older types of buildings as well. And I think that it is really timely that we take a really good look and recognise that whilst high-rise fires will always be something that will be in the focus of our mind because of Grenfell and the inquiry, a lot of the fires we're seeing now are in a wide range of buildings and anywhere where there's residential accommodation and we have buildings that aren't performing in the right way, that's where there's a risk to people and where we need to be focusing. Okay, so that's some of the threats and challenges. Mm. So following on from that, what does a, a modern fire service 
look like in response to those? And that, I'll ask you and, and Fiona and, and Steve if you'd like to comment on that. So I think for me the modern fire service not only is about having the right equipment and um, I welcome the opportunity to begin to talk about technology and our use of data and how we actually anticipate and how we look at past history but how we also predict for the future where we think our risks might be. It is about ensuring that our firefighters have that training and that they are looking when they're out and about, you know, our firefighters are eyes and ears when they're out and about on the streets. They're the ones that should be identifying not only vulnerable people in their communities, and that's key because they are the ones who know where the people at risk are, and opening the big red doors of the fire stations to welcome those people in and make those links with vulnerable and lonely people, but about making sure that when they're out doing their everyday visits, they are looking at fire safety and they're looking at risks to buildings, and they're familiar with the buildings on their ground, and that's the important thing for me, making sure we get the operational risk database fully up to date and having all the information available so when we have the technology, and the data we use on our tablets, that the information there is up to date and they can use that in their everyday business. Yeah. Um, I I'd agree with what the Commissioner said. One of the things I think uh, we've noted over the past few months when we've seen a series of fires that simply shouldn't have happened is actually in some ways at the moment it feels like firefighting in London is sort of back to the future rather than looking at future challenges because um, at the heart of what the brigade and what all of us with an interest in fire and fire safety in London need to look at is actually that some of the deregulation that's taken place over the last 20 years has meant that we are seeing fires that we sh simply should not have firefighters having to tackle and while we are seeing changing, um, changing risks around climate change and other changing risks actually I feel that one of the primary risks and one of the primary challenges of the future is actually around building safety and fire safety issues that um, we, we should have seen the end of by now. And that's sort of going to be a challenge for the brigade as, as we move, move forward. Um, but ultimately, we need to see changes in policy and changes in regulation and changes in enforcement at a na national level that actually sort of eliminate some of the risks that we simply shouldn't be seeing anymore. Okay, Steve. Um, yes, I mean, clearly firefighting is changing and, and, and building construction and methods of construction seem to have raced ahead of regulation and inspection. I think what the, modern, what the future of the fire service can't look like is any smaller than, than it currently is with that developing role of a firefighter, with that having to have that awareness of the built environment and the speed with which technology is changing in the built environment and the effects of climate change that we are seeing with the increase in wildfires nationally, the increase in major flooding events nationally. I think the modern fire service needs to be bigger than it currently is. I think we're still feeling the effects of the closure of 10 fire stations and the removal of 27 pumping appliances from London's fleet and I think it needs to be better funded than it currently is. Dan, you were sort of nodding. Do you want to say something? No, just broadly agreement, really, that uh, some of these issues are, are really outside the, the ring at the fire service, and, and to some extent, the issues we're facing now with the built environment, the, the eyes are on the fire service to solve them, but it's a much wider issue, as Fiona alluded to. Um, we are looking at issues around building control, so supporting local authorities to have robust structures in place to make sure buildings are built properly. Taking some action now to stop what could possibly be another two generations of buildings that are sitting in the pipeline that have had agreements and approvals issued now in what has already been identified to be a broken regime seems like a quick first step and win for us to to you know, we're 20 years behind the curve on some of the uh, construction and poor construction that's out there and whilst we're doing what we can to to answer that challenge it's unhelpful when the bucket continues to be filled because no one's turning off the tap so those kind of things are, are challenges outside of our remit, but nonetheless we've been asked to, to raise them. Yeah, it's clear that a lot of the big fires that we've had in, over the last few months have been in very new buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's new builds, but uh, also refurbishments in old building stock. They need to be properly policed and managed to ensure that they don't uh, introduce hazards into buildings that we would traditionally and customarily look back as, as understanding their design and, and how they work for us in the event of a fire. So, so Proportionally, how, what sort of, how have um, the types of incidents that you respond to changed over the, over the recent years between fire special services and so forth? So I think that um, we haven't particularly seen um, 
an increase in any type of sort of fire being more difficult to tackle. But I think one of the issues is around, I think if we look at social media, for instance, any fire or any incident we now attend is, of course, publicised on social media often before we get there. And I think that can cause undue alarm and concern. I think that the, you know, we see the rate of calls into our control room now and the rate of panic. And one of the things that we've noted and we've done the campaign about recently is about trying to encourage members of the public to phone 999 before they pick their camera up. We get far too many people who will take video footage of an incident, post it to social media, but nobody's actually called us. So by the time we get there, a fire is well developed because everyone's filming it rather than calling us out. I think if you look at some of the issues we have around things like balcony fires. Um, the fire in Barkham was a classic example of that. You know, it's a very prominent, very visible fire. Uh, and the one we had in Hackney as well, where it's involving balconies. And that's something that we have been talking about for a while. We've been raising the issues of wooden uh, balconies. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, when you can't control the behaviours of members of the public, and they think that doing things like um, barbecuing on their balconies or carelessly disposing of cigarettes uh, storing inappropriate materials on there, you know, those become a huge <coughs> risk. And unfortunately, in some of those circumstances, the fire then breaches into the building itself. But I think as well, we need to look at the issues around um, addressing vulnerable people in our communities. Um, and that's where we're doing a lot of work around areas like hoarding. Um, and I think that we are now more aware of hoarding issues. We are doing a lot more local interventions to tackle those. I think some of the problems we're having is around where local authorities simply no longer have the teams and the funding in place to assist us with um, addressing those issues when we refer them on. You know, we've noticed a lot of the kind of intervention days we've had. We've had a lot of members of the community come, community come in and talk openly to us about issues they're having around hoarding. And then it turns out that, you know, they are more likely to be vulnerable people. They might be more likely to be smokers and at risk. And whilst we can't control people's hoarding behaviours, what we want to make sure that those people that do are as safe as they can be in their homes, that they have got working smoke alarms, that they understand the need to have clear exit points. But it's all those works about our local firefighters in local communities, understanding them. But then the wider piece across looking at our building estates, you know, looking at trying to encourage um, local authorities, for instance, in open areas to make sure that they don't allow large piles of rubbish to collect so we don't have, you know, potential risks of open area fires. Where we do have dry spells of weather, we encourage local authorities to have a ban on barbecues, you know, and spoil people's fun. It's not that. It's the fact we don't want their areas to catch, catch fire, you know, and it is about not just us doing the work, but us sharing the work and us making other people aware of where the risks are. And those are all something that, they say, the social media is something that we can use to help with that because the whole issues around messaging and being able to communicate with people, that's an ever-changing <coughs> feast. But, you know, I think for us it is about recognising the different fires we're going to now, but also about being prepared for the things we know are in the background, things like the risk from terrorism and the ever-changing threat that poses. Because although, you know, would there is none but touch it if I could, you know, we are not having a high spike of that at the moment. It is something that's ever present in our minds um, and we need to be constant and prepared so um, I'm sure many of you would be aware there's a large-scale multi uh, cross uh, all different agency incident um, training taking place today where we've had um, it's uh, been run by the Met Police but we've been heavily involved in uh, three scenarios that have taken place across London simulating an attack from terror and our response to that and we currently have large numbers of our firefighters at a venue um, at Twickenham Stadium where we're practicing mass decontamination of members of the public. And that's the kind of example of where we will keep on training for a risk that we think is, you know, ever in the forefront of our minds to make sure that when the bad day happens, we are ready for it. What about other special services? To what, to what extent are you doing more special <coughs> services as opposed to firefighting? I think we've always done a range of it. I think people are more aware that we will respond to anything now. And I think due to other agencies potentially not being available, people will always call us even for the strangest things. So, you know, we, we obviously have the call cool challenge for the more minor instance. So, for in, you know, where we get the, uh, let's say, the classic things like cats up trees, we will refer to the RSPCA first, but obviously if they can't fix it, we will assist in large animal rescues. But I think right across the piece, you know, there is, uh, and we'll get it with weather like today, where wet weather will get a huge increase in road traffic collisions. Um, we seem to be having a space of lots more incidents of cars into buildings for some reason and then of course the work we've been doing around acid attacks and that is something that I'm shocked by the numbers in London that we're seeing increasing on a daily basis 
of people being attacked by another person. And sometimes it isn't acid, but if you had something thrown in your face, you would panic that it was acid. So the work we've done around not only training our own firefighters, but about training right across the piece, so all different forms of transport, you know, the security guards, and the training we've rolled out across all those areas is vital for us. It's about having the right people responding in the right way to the early stages of those attacks to try and prevent the situation worsening. Okay. And uh, the safety plan uh, says that less than 10% of incidents were described as intervention. Is that still the right proportion? Has it gone up or down? I think it's still about the same level from that point of view. Um, so a lot of the incidents we attend... We don't have a direct intervention, but some of what we do is public reassurance, and we're always happy to do that. It's as important as the intervention that we can provide the reassurance, we can assist people, we can guide them. So I think for me, you know, we want to keep the intervention level down if we can, because that's where things have gone really wrong. And that's why I say our work around prevention and protection is so key, and public education too. So all these different challenges, and Steve sort of hinted at it, do we have the right number of firefighters to meet the demand, or... If there's a demand going up, it's not just central fires, but all these other things, do we need more firefighters? So the numbers have gone down dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years. Yes, the numbers have gone down. I think that what we're doing is we're rising to new challenges, and I think that quite rightly, firefighters have uh, a trusted air, you know, view from members of the public. You know, we are the people who, when you knock on the door, you know, 99 times out of 100 people will open the door to firefighters where they may not to other people in the community. I think that role is very important and I think the work we can do about assisting vulnerable people in the community uh, and about being able to, we might be some of the only people who identify those people and have any connections to them. So I think that the broadening role of where firefighters are doing the prevention work is key and I absolutely echo Steve's comments that we wouldn't want to see any reduction in frontline firefighters in the London Fire Brigade. We also know that it's not just about the, the peaks and demands of responding. It's about having sufficient firefighters available to do the training, to do the prevention work, as well as doing the responding. And that on the bad day, when we have large-scale incidents, for instance, the, you know, what we're training with today, that's a large-scale response. We need to be able to do that, but provide our business-as-usual response to London. So for me, you know, there is no way I'd like to see any reduction in uh, firefighters in London. I think they do a fantastic job with the work they do and I think it's ever important that we are out in the community reaching out and making vulnerable people safer. So we've seen quite a few 20 pump, 15 pump fires recently. If we had two 20 pumps on the same day yeah. in different corners of London, could we cope? We could cope. We know we can cope with responding to large-scale operational incidents. And, you know, we have to bear in mind it's not just the maths of two 20-pump fires. It's the special appliances and officers that go to support that. It's the relief appliances we backfill with when those uh, firefighters have been there for a long duration. And it's about ensuring we have that kit and equipment ready. So we can absolutely cope with responding, you know, and reassure members of the public the London Fire Brigade are very much able to cope and deal with operational response. But it is about ensuring that when we are doing that operational response, we have the rest of the fleet and firefighters available to cover London and to do all our other business as usual day-to-day -day work. So, Steve, did you want to add to your previous comment? Um, only in so much as I say that the, 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 the more we understand about firefighter safety and the more we understand about the physiological effects of firefighting in terms of what being in a hot environment and then cooling down and then heating up again actually does to your cardiovascular system, the more it becomes apparent that actually we shouldn't be recycling firefighters at incidents. And once a firefighter has been in a hot environment for 15, 20 minutes wearing a breathing apparatus set, it's time to let that person rest, recover, rehydrate, um, and they need to be replaced by somebody fresh. So I think we're, when we're looking at the, the change in the way fires appear to be behaving, we need to be looking at how many firefighters attend these large incidents and we always need to be thinking about investment and more resources because we need to recycle them quicker if we're going to keep firefighters safe. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I uh, agree wholeheartedly with um, what the Commissioner has said um, and just to note because it's something that the committee has asked previously, the brigades now um, pretty much at full establishment, I think it's eight short of full establishment which is the first time it has been since uh, May 2015. So I think thanks to Sue and Tim for the huge amount of work that's, that's gone into that. Um, I think that we do need to be mindful of the 
pressures on um, firefighters. Uh, I'd only sort of repeat what I said in my previous response, which was if we are having problems with the built environment, we're actually creating or um, there is a creation of a pressure in terms of the number of um, 20 pump fires or sort of over 20 pump fires that we're seeing and that inevitably puts pressure on the brigade on, the, on those days although I have to say that the professionalism of the brigade staff of the firefighters and everybody else involved um, uh, it, I mean it, it, it runs amazingly and I know you've been to see a um, you've been to a fire ground relatively recently yourself so I think that um, it's taken quite a lot to get back to full, full establishment and I think um, we'll obviously continue to review on an ongoing basis as recommended by um, Anthony Mayor to make sure that the brigade has the resources it needs to um, meet the challenges it faces. Uh, Danny, you told us in May that the strategic resource, resource review mm -hmm. would report in September. Yeah. Has it? Uh, no, what, 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 the, what are the conclusions? No, so it will report through my internal governance process uh, in October time, um, at which point I will then get the full report, which I will then be happy to bring back to uh, the next prep, hopefully for uh, November time. Uh, I can share it with you then. So it is uh, well underway and well in progress, and I'm anticipating next month it will come through to me. Okay, and then after Grenfell, you put forward your immediate shopping list to the mayor. Um, both in terms of, of personnel and revenue costs and also equipment. Uh, how far have you got with getting the equipment that you need? Are you on schedule with that? To what extent has your uh, shopping list changed? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the, you know, obviously we've had the success of bringing in the fire hoods uh, and they have proved to be invaluable on a number of occasions. We had an incident only last week where uh, a man was uh, able to be uh, brought down from a loft space using a smoke hood, uh, where another man was uh, rescued down a ladder using a smoke hood. And I think um, to date that we've had 25 successful rescues using the smoke hood, so they have proved to be an absolute asset and are getting used more and more. And I think even to the point where, you know, where circumstance where we might not have thought that people were a risk in smoke they're just a really good public reassurance piece as well so i'm very pleased with how they're going um the aerial appliances so uh tom george and i went to germany last week to go and visit the factory where our aerial appliances are being made and the first 32 meters are rolling off the production line as we speak and will then be coming over to the uk to go up to e1 in scotland to have the rest of the fit done for those and we anticipate them being with us early next year ready to be trained on and available um, I've also put um, some persuasive pressure on the people to ensure that the first 64 metre is available uh, and at least in the UK before I retire. I will have it in London before I go. <laughs> um, I've seen it. It's a very impressive piece of kit. It's a uh, you know, huge amount of technology in it and I'm really looking forward to welcoming those into London. Um, the rest of the equipment, so the breathing apparatus and the... Uh, communications that go with that that project, a large scale project. What we did was make sure that we've decoupled the radio interface away from the replacement breathing apparatus sets because it's vitally important that we replace the radio interface first because that's one of the things that firefighters regularly and rightly uh, are complaining about not working properly. So we'll ensure that whatever kit we buy is then compatible with the new breathing apparatus set. But it's important that we can not delay one with the other um, and the project team is working closely on those. I'll leave Dan to fill in where we are with his fire safety shopping list of staff and training and he will make the point as he always does that it's uh, not easy to buy uh, fire safety teams because of the training that that involves but he can give you an up to date with those. So I think the drones are one of the things that I am the most excited about, mm -hmm. strange thing to say, but they are proving such a fantastic success. Um, you know, we've had them out and about on so many operational incidents now, and not just firefighting, we've had them out to give us situational awareness where we've had large scale water incidents. Um, for in we had them at the uh, fire at Worcester Park, and what we managed to do with the drone was not only to fly it over the building to give us an idea of the structure of the building, we flew it into the underground car park. And that allowed us to view the underside of the building, to look at building construction, and to look at the levels of water because there was an electrical substation in there. So they're very versatile. We've also assisted the police in a search for, highly, uh, for a missing, highly vulnerable person. Uh, and we're just finding out they're 
you know, they're increasingly being used. We've got obviously the option or the ability now to use them as a loud hailer, so we can fly them up to the outside of the building with a message and shout the message into the building, and they are very loud. Um, and we've also got an app now on senior officers' phones that we're trialling. That means that I can look at the drone activity from wherever I am. I can log into and get a live stream whenever the drone is up. So for situational awareness for senior officers away from the scene, they are proving invaluable. Um, so, so, so I look forward to welcoming them in soon. So when do we make the formal decision that we're going to have the drones then? Uh, still very the soon. Uh, so what they're working up at the moment is the model for delivery. So we definitely want them. We're going to have them. It's about how best to deliver them to the fire ground and resource them with staff, and which the best model for that is about actually having a whether we have a dedicated team like we have at the moment, which perform a day job and then ride out with a van, or whether we incorporate them onto another appliance is the work that's being done at the moment. But the paper is going through the Deputy Commissioner's boards at the moment, and I anticipate it will be at my board, I think, next month. And EDBA, I think there have been additional thoughts about that. So part of the concern around EDBA is exactly what Steve was just making reference to. It's about the fact our firefighters aren't robots. I know we want to talk about technology later, but we do not wish to put uh, unnecessary physiological demands on firefighters. So it is about you know, ensuring that we have EDBA for the use we need to for extended duration, but that it isn't something where we will be routinely uh, committing our firefighters into long periods of time into very hot situations because there's more and more research being done now, uh, quite rightly, into the physiological effect on firefighters of extended exposure to heat. Uh, and especially, I think people don't always consider the fact that, you know, when a firefighter goes into a fire, not only are they dressed exceedingly warmly and are very well protected fire gear, as they should be, but you're then going into a very hot environment and you're then doing exercise. All three things, of course, add a real additional exertion on people's bodies. So it is about balancing the science with the technology that would allow us to work for longer. So part of the work is not just around uh, researching new technologies, it's about looking at the actual physical impact on human beings. Okay, Dan, did you want to add something? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly give you an update. I, I want to prove the Commissioner wrong, so if I start by saying it's extremely difficult to uh, <laughs> recruit fire safety staff in this climate. Um, I mean, those challenges haven't gone away. Uh, we are exploring new ways to think about how we might uh, value those skills um, within the sort of fire sector. Um, I'm, I don't think we're going to get close to being able to bridge the gap between us and what's being offered in the private sector, but we are extremely lucky to have some of the skills we have, and I think we need to recognise that and try and make it a more attractive opportunity to come work for London Fire Brigade and work in the fire sector to actually uh, affect good and change in the, the built environment, which is something that uh, is unique to us, because as I've said before, we are completely unconflicted in our stance on what we're here to do, and that's about public safety and public reassurance, and we don't answer to, to any other driver, really, in, in what we're here to do. So a couple of uh, highlights for me, the cold scene examiners that we introduced into our FIT, uh, they have been working on a number of projects to try and identify trends and themes. Uh, most telling is the work they've done recently around balcony fires, which uh, has only recently been put through some of our directorate boards. Um, so we've seen some balcony fires in some modern buildings that have had some quite spectacular imagery uh, in news footage, but actually we hadn't appreciated how many we'd had over the last uh, 26 months, around 400 of those in London. It's a significant number, um, and what we have identified from that is trends such as careless disposal of cigarettes, people having barbecues, and uh, items people store on balconies that uh, make them more readily uh, ignitable to, to stray cigarettes and things like that. So, so that's an area that we can do some education around and certainly try and understand the challenges for firefighters when they arrive at the scene and what they're faced with. Um, the next challenge for that team is to look at compartmentation breaches within buildings. So whilst that sounds quite an easy thing to identify, actually my concern at the moment is it's underreported partly because firefighters wouldn't recognise early signs and scenes of that. And that's, that's not down to um, uh, an issue with firefighters, it's what we haven't taught firefighters for a number of years, so while we're reintroducing that training in regulatory fire safety for firefighters. Equally, it's taking away the, the human actions and firefighting actions that might give indications of compartmentalia failures, which aren't actually attributable to the fire. So when we understand that, we'll understand the uh, true extent to which we should be concerned about some building types. Um, also, the care home work that we did, I think we reported previously, previously to this committee, a special projects group that looked at care homes in isolation, carried out more intrusive surveys, and found that over 50% of care homes required some level of enforcement. So that's a piece of work we've committed to carry on throughout this year to visit all 1,300 care homes in London, and that work's well underway. Um, we are developing our first 16 cohort of fire safety advisors, which will be the entry level for fire safety officers. 
and the ambition for those people as they will move through and become our IOs of the future, but with a broader understanding of the wider role of fire safety to engage both community and regulatory roles and bridge the gap with firefighters as well for that understanding. Uh, we have development officers in place and a, a well-developed uh, learning and development team now and a quality assurance process is making sure that our firefighters, uh, sorry, our IOs are well equipped to deal with what is a very dynamic and challenging built environment and are up to speed with some of those advancements that as Steve identified has really outstripped the pace of inspection and regulation over recent years. Um, yeah, I think it, that's a, in a nutshell a few things that are going on. Okay, thanks. Steve, do you want to add anything? Only in so much as where we were talking about equipment. Uh, the equipment is only as good as the firefighters that are operating it and, and the focus in terms of investment needs to be about the people, having the right people with the right training and the right equipment able to respond. I, I was just, well, if I can just make a comment, I've seen the uh, latest performance updates, they're incredible, so thank you. So clearly firefighters are being trained extremely well because um, uh, some of these performance <coughs> updates are incredible. So really pleased about that. Um, thrilled about the drones as well because it keeps firefighters safer if you can see what's happening before you go. Just one quick question though. Hoarding has been something I've looked into a lot in Harrow, etc. When you know that, because you can't always make people do anything about their hoarding and of course it's so dangerous for our firefighters, do you manage to put that as a risk down on your tablets? As in, you do. That's fine. We do. Okay. Yes, it's entered onto the ORDs so that, uh, because obviously, it's, uh, you know, the, the station itself might be aware, but if their station are off doing training or on another incident, their non coming station might not be aware. So we do have <coughs> information onto the day space. Um, we have to be very careful, obviously, around data protection yeah, and no, identification of people. But for us, the, the issues are around the safety of the individual and the safety of firefighters. Yeah. Because increased fire loading obviously increases the risk to firefighters when they enter the premises. Uh, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Shall I go on to yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, right, I've got the next section. So, um, <coughs> um, Danny, the, how is the approach to how fires are fought in a modern city changing? You've touched on this a bit. So I think that um, it's, you know, a lot of it is about the people that we are involved in firefighting and protecting and looking after. So I think that, you know, and we've touched a lot and we will refer a lot back to modern methods of construction and some of the fires we've seen so recently that have been so highly profiled like the fire at Worcester Park, um, I think people are aware that within a very short space of time it had developed from being what was a very small scale fire to a building that was entirely ablaze. Um, <coughs> I have to say that I think on that occasion um, we were lucky that some of those properties were empty at the time of the fire because I'm not sure we would have been able to reach those people in time due to the rapidity of the fire spread and the fact that they were, a lot of the people were alerted by a very uh, quick thinking member of the public in the flats who got out and got into his car and sounded his car horn repeatedly to alert other residents of the block of flats. I think it was, it's quite shocking to see a development that looked like such a beautiful, pretty place and a lovely place to live in of something that could develop and spread so very quickly, resulting in such a devastating loss of properties. But then we also have the other side of that where we look at people who are in substandard accommodation or people who are in HMOs. So we've had several calls recently uh, to fires that look like an average, maybe semi-detached property or a terrace property. And when firefighters actually attend and tackle a fire, they find out they've been sublet into five different rooms. Um, we had some horror stories recently where the, you know, firefighters have gone into a terrace house and found five different family units living in there, mm. which is not what you'd expect, you know, all behind doors, insufficient means of escape, no means of alerting the residents in the event of a fire, and somewhere we've had to carry out multiple rescues. Uh, one where I have to say I was immensely proud of the firefighters involved in South Hall, who not only carried out some very efficient rescues, but then performed CPR on several members of the public at the same time, um, to an incredibly high standard, to the point where the paramedic who attended said that without a shadow of a doubt, without the actions of our firefighters, these people would have died. And they managed to resuscitate the people and bring them back, which was incredible. But they wouldn't have expected to find a family of five living in a one room of a property in a semi-detached house. So I think those are things that, those are the unseen risks we face now, because until we attend those incidents, we never know those people are there. And half the problem is that these are people who are obviously, you know, on very low income, 
um, and who are not regularly in contact with the authorities and who are just being, in some ways, taken advantage of by people who sublet properties illegally. Once we found out, we will do the work and work on prosecution, but until we find them, those people are at risk. Um, so that concerns me, and it is about the work that Dan said about care homes, because those are people, you know, if you put your loved ones in a care home, you expect them to be in somewhere where there will be a vulnerable person who is safe, and we are finding time and time again, I think it's nearly 50% of our care homes are having some form of deficiency notice served upon them because they are not fit for purpose, and that's a risk for us. So I think that... You know, it is about buildings, it's about the rate of buildings going up, it's about identifying those, but it is about the people who are in them and trying to do what we can to identify vulnerable people and help them. Um, but for me, I am genuinely concerned that there are so many unknowns in London. Um, I had a, you know, a very interesting conversation post Worcester Park where somebody asked me if we could identify the dangerous buildings in London which I thought was a very interesting thing to ask me. Unless I had x-ray vision and could look and take the building materials off the outside of each building, I can't possibly tell them which way they've been built. I can't tell if they've got the right fire stopping in them. I can't tell you know, if the right measures have been taking place inside them. And I think one of the interesting things was a building in uh, Croydon where they had ACM cladding on it. And when they removed the ACM cladding from the building, they found cracks in the actual construction of the building that means that it is now had to be decanted because it isn't safe for people to live in. So there are risks that we don't know about until we attend. And as Dan said, I think the concern is that people think that London Fire Brigade and the Fire Service nationally will be able to address all of those risks and we'll be able to sort of ride down the hill on our white charges and save everybody. But some of these buildings are frankly very dangerous places for people to live in. So it's about trying to make sure that we do what we can to work with responsible people and try and identify those buildings and keep people safe. Have you had a word with any insurance companies or the insurance companies um, around things that perhaps they should put into their questionnaires when people are insuring their buildings, etc.? So we've had discussions in the past mainly around sprinklers, but part of the, the overall thinking with some of the insurance companies is they'll be looking for, for evidential proof, and some of that evidential proof will be in having the correct permissions in place to carry out the development. <coughs> And in vast number of cases, people will have those uh, permissions, but it's the competency of the people that are granting those permissions in the first place and the adequacy of the training around the people that are, under, are writing off those permissions. So if we look at building control as, as one example um, and the use of AIs, so there are a number of authorities that will use AIs rather than uh, they have their own in-house building control to work on certain projects and certain developments. And we have a question around the competency within that uh, particular arena. You know, what, what is the body that's overseeing the standards for AIs? And equally, where are AIs conflicted when sometimes AIs work as a subsidiary of a parent company that is the developer? And where are their interests? And, and look, I'll take you back to my point where you know, we're totally unconflicted, London Fire Brigade, and it's about public safety, public reassurance. I question sometimes where those AIs would sit in that. And in the competitive market, I hear stories around building control bodies that uh, are trying to win contracts to oversee developments. And the, the level at which they can then provide scrutiny in order to be competitive in that market is way below the standard some of those control officers would like to work at. So buildings are being built and they aren't being monitored throughout that build process, but yet they'll have the sign-off certificates that will allow an insurance company to assume, as I think most of us would, that these buildings have been built correctly. We're finding out now, tragically through some incidents, uh, and just in our experience in London, that that's just not the case. It's very bad that it's getting worse, whereas something like this should be getting so, so much better. Um, I do wonder at some point whether there's some avenue through insurance companies because they're the ones that will suffer if there is an issue, and perhaps they might be able to put in stronger controls to make sure that the buildings, et cetera, that they're insuring are in um, better, better condition, because that would help everybody mm. all along. Can I say on that, I think that's happening in the States, in the areas where they get a lot of wildfires, that the insurance companies are, are pushing on people not rebuilding where there's danger. So obviously that's not quite the same point, but I think that there, are, there are examples around the world of insurance companies pushing, pushing forward on this. Well, it might be something that would, would, would certainly yeah. help the brigade and everybody around. Um, what do you think is the impact that, <coughs> that all this is having on the day-to-day -day duties of London's firefighters, the, the changing scene, as it were? 
I think that uh, it means that our firefighters have to be more flexible, more adaptable. They have to be ready for a different range of incidents that we were never facing in the past. I think that very much for me there is something about when our firefighters are attending operational incidents that they have to be doing that risk assessment, sort of dynamic risk assessment work very quickly. Um, and what I'm really commended to see is that they are on a regular occurrence, people like watch managers are asking in a very timely fashion for additional resources um, and you know making up very quickly because you know we are seeing these rapidly developing fires and the absolute answer is to get more firefighters and more resources there um, to be able to tackle them and to be able to ensure we're not overburdening any of our firefighters so I think that that's a, a different level than our firefighters have been exposed to before um, I think that you know they are it's a, just a really wide-ranging number of jobs that we're doing at the moment. Um, one of the things that I don't think people would even associate knowing what we're doing is we've had several instances this year caused by weather, both cold and hot, of uh, firefighters having to assist with decanting people from trains. So we had an instance of it in March of cold weather and then during the very hot periods in August where due to occurrences, fires on tracks and uh, defects in the railway system where trains were frozen in a position and people were then trapped on them and then we have to go along and assist in removing the people from the trains and safe exit back to a station. Um, a lot of that work has been coordinated by our national interagency liaison officers uh, and London obviously are the lead for that but I think that those are the types of work that people wouldn't necessarily have anticipated. Um, I think you know if you look at we do a lot of tweeting around different operational incidents and our concerns something to you know the, the different fire safety messages around things like deflected light so People laugh when we say, you know, don't have crystal door handles and leave them in, exposed in the sun or hang crystal things in your window because we have seen numbers of fires that are caused <coughs> by a refraction of light um, and as any small child has ever experimented with a magnifying glass will know, it's very easy to start a fire by concentrating the sun's beams. So it's all about the understanding the different levels that sort of make up the firefighters' role in doing the, you know, even the education piece. And I was very proud to go out uh, with a crew from Beckenham recently to celebrate our one millionth home fire safety visit the London Fire Brigade have undertaken. And we went and visited a 92-year-old woman who was partially sighted. Um, and we went to do the visits to a home fire safety visit and a check and a replacement of a smoke alarm for her. Uh, and once again, I was just so astounded by the professionalism of the crew, the conversation they were having with her to ensure that she was safe across a number of issues in her home. But mainly it was one of the things that identified to me there are so many lonely, vulnerable people mm -hmm. uh, in our city and the fact that people are increasingly being cared for in their homes rather than in care properties because they just aren't available. Um, you know, and that this woman actually, part of the benefit from us being there was just engaging her in a conversation as well as managing to do all the safety interventions for her. Um, and for me, looking at the proactive work that our local boroughs are doing around identifying those vulnerable people and inviting them into the fire station and giving them somewhere where they can meet and where we can then identify what steps we can take to keep them safer. I'm just really proud of the local initiatives and how proactive they are being. Yes, I've been to some in, in Harrow and they've been incredible with what they do. And of course, the home fire safety visits have gone of years and have proved so successful by the lack of fires that we get now in comparison. Um, if, you, if you look forward to perceived new risks, how are you identifying new risks? And um, can you see anything becoming worse uh, in, in the near future? So I think that, you know, I, I can't help refer back to uh, building construction and the risks that we are facing. I think if you look around the country, and obviously that one of the things that uh, all of my teams do is not only look countrywide, but, you know, worldwide around any trends and anything that we see coming out. Um, you know, we've seen a number of building fires in the UK that I think most people have been shocked by the, uh, you know, rapid fire spread and destruction of two hotels and a care home in Cheshire that were completely destroyed by fire. Um, and I think that whilst we will always look across uh, every single different sort of service we give, the increasing number, and we have seen, you know, not only places like the way they're residential, but the fire we attended in Walthamstow in the shopping centre there, and the fire spread through the ceiling there. And, you know, so I think that one of the important things is we will keep talking about sprinklers and the importance of automatic fire suppressant systems. You know, we think that there's an absolute case to be made for those. But some of the buildings where we have been, 
you know, the fire spread and where those fires have developed aren't places that would have been sprinklered, and those are still around how buildings inside are not fire stopped correctly and they haven't got the right levels of protection. So it's about educating our firefighters, I think, especially about recognising different patterns of fire spread and getting resources there in a timely fashion to respond to those. Um, but we will keep, I say, training for the things that we think might be coming down the line or things that we think are increasing risks for London um, and terrorism being one of those that we will make sure that we are continually training and ready and prepared for. So are you changing the way firefighters are trained? Because, I mean, if you, if you look back 20, 25 years or whatever, when have you started, for instance? I mean, there were far more fires. It was so very different mm. to, to as it is now. So are you changing the training of firefighters to accommodate the fact that it's a, diff a completely different service to the one it was? Yeah, and I think we have, um, you know, so when I look back 32 years ago, when I started and did my training, uh, it was a very different beast, but now we have so many more opportunities available with technology to do interactive training and to do training on fire stations using computer-enhanced technology. And it is about ensuring that where, thankfully, our fires are reducing and across a lot of the cases, we are then providing training to supplement that. Um, and there's nothing that beats the actual hands-on equipment training out in the yard to ensure our firefighters are competent and ready to respond with our basic equipment. But there is also the information we supply to them, the training packages, and then the training we do, you know, as part of our uh, training. So we take them to do regular breathing apparatus training, instant command training, and ensuring that we are fit and ready. And, you know, for me, training is vital because, you know, there are circumstances we don't want to see, but we need to train and be prepared. And I think we have looked recently at our training and we've looked at the way we deliver training, not only to our firefighters on fire stations, but the regular training they go away and do. And it is, for me, making sure that we continually review that and are not complacent about how our firefighters are trained. Uh, and I've um, mentioned it previously, but I've commissioned an independent review into our training. Um, because I think that it's very important that I've got an external pair of eyes to come in and look right across the piece. And that's just not about our training contract, that is about our firefighters' day-to-day -day training on fire stations and the availability of training for all of my staff. Um, and we will be expecting that to come back for a report back to my Commissioner's Board next month. And I'll be really happy to come back and give you the report on that. OK, so the findings aren't through yet. Can you just tell me, if, if, if a firefighter wants to do lots of extra training, is it easy for them to go off and do that? Or if they don't want to do any extra training, is that acceptable? Uh, it's not acceptable for firefighters not to train. Uh, no, I don't mean for the putting out the fire. I mean yeah. for the doing the, the specialist yeah. bits. So obviously with the firefighters who have specialist skills like our fire rescue unit uh, firefighters, we invest large sums of money uh, mm. you know, and commitments into them to ensure that they have absolutely the right training because they do undertake the higher risk uh, responses. So where we've got people who are doing water rescue training, urban search and rescue training, rope rescue training, obviously we want them to have a hugely enhanced level of training because those factors carry more risk. So we spend time and investment. Uh, what we wouldn't seek to do is train a firefighter at a fire rescue unit and then them to move station a year later because we've invested literally thousands of pounds in their training. What we don't want to do is have people tied to those stations because they have those skills. So there is a fine balance between ensuring that our firefighters that are on those stations have the right training and are operationally fit and ready and not actually you know, condemning people to a lifetime at one station because of the particular appliance that they have there. Because that was an issue. Yeah, that's OK. Um, yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, training is fundamental to firefighter safety. Uh, and, and, and I look forward to the, the outcome of the independent review. But, but I would say that from, from our point of view, we don't think we've been particularly well served by having an external training provider. I, I think in-house training would have given us additional flexibility to respond to changing risks, uh, to, to enable training to change much faster when new information has become available. In-house trainers are obviously more accountable and in-house trainers are more current in terms of their current understanding of firefighting uh, procedures and equipment. And uh, we'll, we'll see what the independent review says, but uh, I would definitely like to see a return to in-house training in London Fire Brigade. Just one final question. Are firefighters required to drive the fire tenders now, or are they not? Because we went through a period when everybody had to 
be so, a driver. Uh, we've reduced the absolute requirement for all firefighters, new trainee firefighters, to drive because we are now up to a, a sufficient number of our firefighters. <coughs> Uh, what we do need to do is keep on top of that because, of, as you're well aware, previously we had a situation where we had so few drivers that the drivers were just driving continuously, which meant that they weren't exposed to the rest of the uh, operational activities. So it is about having that fine balance between ensuring that uh, we have the right number of people. The other thing is that it's very important that we make sure that those people who are drivers are regularly refreshed on their driving training and have those skills up to date. So the right number of people that we can keep on, do on top of their training and they are available to drive, but not so it's restrictive and we have people who just solely become drivers like we had in the past. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, afternoon, yeah, so I'm gonna ask you um, a few questions about fire safety and prevention. I, I you've mentioned some of that already in your previous answers, um, Danny particularly, but um, could, could you tell us, what, what do you think as a summary, what, what does modern day fire safety and prevention look like? And and what do you do uh, to drive down um, fires and uh, emergencies from happening? So absolutely, there's kind of the two prongs of it for me. There is the work that our frontline firefighters do uh, in the everyday encounters they have about fire safety and keeping communities safer. And I think that's a very wide ranging piece of work. I think that's, I've uh, been very vocal about making sure my borough commanders are addressing local risk because as you're well aware, the risk across London and across our boroughs vary greatly. And the importance for me is that our local borough commanders involve their fire stations in identifying that risk and responding to that risk. Um, and that's been done in many different ways. And I think that we've seen some fantastic examples recently of local fire stations adapting the way they interact with their local communities. Um, you know, we have things like um, Orpington Fire Station have something called Silver Sundays, where they invite people from local communities into the fire station on a Sunday. They also then have activities where they <coughs> encourage uh, isolated members of the community to be able to come in and take part in activities. Uh, Acton Fire Station, for instance, has a regular um, event where they invite vulnerable people in, and that's become an increasing uh, number of times a year where they have effectively tea dances, uh, which is just great, because during those inter interactions and the encounters with those people in the communities, that's when you find out where they have problems and where we might be able to identify that they might be suffering from fuel poverty and they may not be able to, you know, be able to get from A to B or they might not be able to heat their house, for instance. So those have been really positive. And I think just the, as you're well aware, the interactions with people are something that boosts them. But then it's about using technology. It's about our borough commands. We now have a toolkit available for all our borough commanders to use. Uh, and that's an ability that where they can have a number of community safety subjects that they can access online and then take into their local communities and share with partners. And I think linking with partners and being able to share information with local authorities and other people who have interactions. So we're seeing a massive increase in us doing um, safeguarding referrals where we are the people who are identifying vulnerable both adults and children in our community and passing that information through to local authorities because it's very important that you know we aren't the only ones that know about these people. And I think it's still quite sad that a number of our cases around um, where we have fire deaths in our homes, accidental fire deaths, there are still a number of those people who are not known to us at all. But we still do find there are other people in the community who have known that these people are vulnerable and have not spoken to us. Um, you know, there are still all the interventions we're taking place with, you know, uh, fire safety bedding and materials that we can share with people. You know, the positive things we've had around the safe and well visits that we were doing that we're now uh, gone through all the phases for and we're doing the evaluation on. So it is about us making sure that um, not only is our local community work from our firefighters doing that, but we still sit um, as London Fire Brigade as a key role in working with government and working nationally on providing fire safety advice. So uh, Dan himself is taking part uh, in the new work we're doing around responding to the new risks, we're emerging risk we're seeing, uh, the new projects that have been set up here, we are supplying, we have members of London Fire Brigade Fire Safety Department who work whole time on those projects at the moment, because although it's a loss of one of our professional <coughs> members for us, the wider work they're doing for the UK Fire Service and for government is really important to make sure that we've got our voice heard. So I think it is at the professional level and at the local level, and across that we are really reaching out to all areas of communities to make a difference. Great, thanks. Uh, what, do you do, what do you do with industry to um, support the development of safer homes and workplaces and, and also entertainment places as well? Dan, do you want to do yeah. the detail on that? So, so, so we've, um, 
I won't uh, labour on the total recalls campaign, but that's something I'm yeah. sure everyone's aware of, the work we've done there, working with manufacturers to improve standards and also the availability of information for consumers to, to report faulty goods. Uh, something we're thinking around of the built environment at the moment. So for many years, there's been a, a concept of secure by design that the Met Police have had in place. And we're working to try and get some early uh, adopters to work on a principle of safe and secure by design. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that evolves into being some sort of charter mark for developers who can demonstrate the highest standards of competency and confidence in the build quality process from the moment they break ground to the moment they top out that, that building, then that's mm -hmm. something that, you know, with, with our support, we could maybe influence the standards and get some self-regulation within that environment because whilst you know there is there's the Dame Judith Hackett review and there is some commitment to, to developing that new regulatory process and, and, and program, I still firmly believe it, it's beholden on the industry to ensure that when they're building places for people to live in, places where people should feel safe, whatever else is going on in the world, uh, that they have a responsibility to make sure that they, they live up to what they're selling. Yeah. That's, that's great. I, but I know you said earlier there was you know, possibly some of the buildings that have already been given planning permission, they might have you know, potentially problems if they don't um, you know, meet the kind of safety criteria that you would, you would like. I mean, how can you influence um, you know, the building of things that maybe already been given permission that might be going to be built in the next year or two? to ensure that they're safe? So, so I think we're fairly limited other than that lobbying voice that we've been talking about. So mm. there's a number of reasons why buildings don't get built to plan. Mm. So we talked about the, the oversight and the regulation of that through building control. There's also uh, methods of value engineering. So what, what's put to us as a statutory consultee, what would go to building control, mm. may not be what the finished product is. And I say that could be down to value, value engineering, could equally down to the competence of the construction employees and how the, the things are built so one of the, the issues we often find is that cavity barriers that should be fitted in timber frame buildings uh, and other structures where they are cavities that need protecting those barriers are sometimes not fitted fitted incorrectly mm. or fitted inappropriately uh, in one recent circumstance the barriers were in place in some areas of the building but they were barriers uh, that were designed for a cavity half the size of what they were intended to to stop so those kind of things it, it's very hard for us post-build and uh, the example that the Commissioner spoke about earlier, the Worcester Park development, high-end development, aspirational living for most, most people. Uh, even in that development, the, the issues were hidden within the walls. So we carried out a, a, a very deep uh, inspection uh, beyond what we'd normally do in terms of audits of a sister block and there were no failings that we could identify from an RO perspective. That, that's the, the, the mechanism through which we could prosecute or take that building to those building owners and developers to account. Mm. The reality is it wasn't until that building caught fire and there was a deconstruction of the actual uh, materials that, that made up the external envelope of that building that the issues came to light. So it's really, really difficult and it's absolutely about making sure throughout the construction phase that the, the checks and balances are in place. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, Deputy Mayor, have you got any comments on that? I mean, what, what else <coughs> do you think could be done um, to work with industry? Um, well, I think um, it's, it is about working in industry, but actually it's working in broader partnerships. And I think um, one of the... Um, Dan mentioned the Total Recall campaign, and uh, the brigades worked very closely with, the, um, with charities such as which um, who promote sort of fire safety and have done a lot of campaigning um, alongside and in parallel to the, the the brigade and I think one of the ways that it's most helpful is actually um, that the many voices mean that you get more hits in in the media people start um, start understanding that they need to um, check fire safety of, of some white goods what I would say, however, is sometimes if you go to um, uh, retailers, they still look at you a bit strangely if you ask what's on the backing of a fridge freezer. So I think we need to get that knowledge out from beyond um, groups of people like ourselves, um, people who have sort of um, gone to the trouble of looking up um, on, on which, where they have all the sort of products not to buy. They're very clear that is a subscription service but if there's something that they think isn't safe they will have that on the open web um, web pages um, but actually it's about getting getting that message beyond beyond those people and actually making sure that uh, the 
the the person who's sort of in the shop talking to yeah. people about the goods actually also understands that the backing of mm. things like a fridge freezer is significant and actually we need retailers to simply stop selling them mm. and we need sort of the second hand good market to be much more rigorously controlled in terms of what people can resell um, mm. particularly around um, I think there have been some advantages there have been some advances lately but some of the things that have been able to be sold even uh, around mm. recall products um, it, it presents a, a, a real fire risk yeah. But that's the kind of whole yeah. different issue, like white goods and electrical appliances yeah. and things people have in their homes, which is a, another issue as well as the sort of building construction. But um, I, know, I know, Commissioner, one of the things that you do in the London Fire Brigade is that you, know, you mentioned the Fire Safe and Well um, program and home fire safety programs and, and so on. I mean, how are those going and how, how effective have you found they, they to be in preventing so fires? We're um, currently evaluating the uh, fire safe and well visits. The programme has uh, come to an end at the moment and we're doing evaluation through MOPAC, which will come through to my board and then Fiona's board um, in, we're anticipating probably in January next year. And I'm happy to bring that update, but you know, we've seen quite a good uptake on those. I think that you know, right across all of our home fire safety visit interventions are so really proud to have reached our one millionth home fire safety visit. That's a million people in London we've reached out to to go into their homes and make them safer. Um, and we know, you know, that the ageing population in London, more people being cared for at home, those are presenting more risks to those people and ensuring that we can reach those people and make the right interventions for them, make sure that, you know, where people are being cared for at home, there are risk assessments in place. You know, where there are people coming and going from those houses, you know, those are the ones that regularly see the day to day activity. They can take note of things like careless disposal of smoking materials, mm. and there's plenty of things we can do to assist with those. But unless people come forward and tell us about them, you know, sometimes we don't find out tragically until it's too late. Mm. So it is very much about being able to make the links in with other areas of the community, make the links in with people like Meals on Wheels where they still exist and local community visits um, where people you know, go and help those people. And actually just reaching out to people with family and friends because lots more people are now being cared for by, at home by mm. family and friends. And some people don't realise that London Fire Brigade can come out and provide that assistance and, and do it for free. I think that people are concerned because you know, there's often people on lower paid uh, incomes who think that we're going to charge. You know, We'll come out for free, we'll provide that service. We can provide fire retardant bedding, we can fit smoke alarms and we can give advice. And I think you know the more we can <coughs> open our big red doors of fire stations, get those community members in that we were talking about. I know that in one area, I think it was in, in up in check where it was, I've got all facts and figures, but we had uh, their first um, Islington. They had their first station open day in conjunction with um, Macmillan Cancer Charity, um, and they had a member of the public who came in and who was talking about the fact that she had a 15-year-old smoke alarm. So we said, absolutely, of course, we'll come and fit you a new one. And then she raised concern that she thought that she didn't, she had a lot of portable heaters because she couldn't afford to heat her house properly. So, uh, you know, she might be overloading her electrical socket. So we said we'd come and advise that. And then she kind of broke down and told us that she was also a hoarder and she'd been too embarrassed to ask for help. But, you know, just that event by her being there and talking to a member of the staff who was really supportive and understanding has meant we've reached out to another vulnerable person. Um, and I think each of those individual so stories show that London firefighters and the staff that work for us are the people absolutely in the right place to make those links and, you know, protect people and make them safer. Yeah, just a bit on um, home fire safety visits, because the increase in home fire safety visits and other preventative work <coughs> over the years has been fantastic because you know, the stats speak for themselves. Um, the million home fire safety visits, uh, are they individual people or do you do revisits? And the reason for the question is, of course, vulnerable people don't stop being vulnerable mm. because of one visit um, mm. and over a period of time it might require a few just mm. to check in on them. Is that built in? Oh, does it mean it's not much individual? Yes, I haven't got the total number on top of my head, so I think this is the one millionth address right, at so which a home fire yeah. safety was carried out yeah. and it's something like two and a half million people that, that would have resided within those properties that would have benefited from the information. Sure. So obviously it's not just about fitting the smoke alarms, actually far, far more of the importance is on the advice that's given. Sure. Okay, so that's good. So the second part of the question was, do you revisit people over periods of time? Um, because vulnerable people will be vulnerable for extended periods of time and they might need a check. Yeah, 
and also people obviously move dresses as well so we you know they're not necessarily in the same place so um, it depends on a lot of it depends on referrals so we've been picking up a lot of work from things like uh, so one of our local borough commands has been working with their hospital local hospital so where they have the hospital have been discharging uh, older people in the back to the community following operations, they are putting the referral through to us. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the reason we picked up uh, the 92-year-old woman in Beckenham was because she'd recently had a stay in hospital. Um, and while being discharged, they had a conversation, they then sent the data through to us, we then booked the visit and came out to visit her. So it is about as much of us asking partners to identify those people mm -hmm. where they think they're at risk. Um, and you know the whole reach out to local communities to say, where well, you have got those people, we will come back. Um, we do, you know, we offer the services across a range of different ways that people can access it. Um, we will, of course, never reach a point where we've visited everybody because of the transient nature of the population of London and people. So we will keep visiting those people and mm. asking. It is as much about asking other people to help us out because there are so many people out there who do know where these people are and who can help us to provide sort of that information so we can go and visit them. Mm. Okay. Sorry. Well, we're going to move on and talk about data and technology. Um, we talked about drones earlier on, which is a shame because I was, I was looking forward to getting into a really good discussion about drones. Because, oh, I can talk um, more about drones. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> well, I, I went to the um, urban search and rescue training in Lincolnshire in, I think, February of this year. And I know the chairman's been there as well um, and saw them. They, they demonstrated the use and uh, I was extraordinarily impressed. And it, it, it's clearly going to be a massive tool for the future. Leaving aside drones, though, um, what are the main strategic objectives in the use of data and information technology for the brigade going off into the future? So I think uh, one of the things we published very recently is our LFB in a digital world, our information and technology strategy, mm -hmm. which um, to a lot of people might realise, I will commend it as a really good read because what the team have done, which is really fascinating, is at the back of the appendices, they've given a demonstration of the future of the different roles of different people in the fire service and what their future will look like through technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the example of a firefighter on a fire station, what technology they will be able to access in the future, someone in the control room, a fire safety inspecting officer. And it's really interesting because it talks about, you know, the technology that they'll be able to use, the things like, you know, um, and it's this whole weird internet of things, I'm not quite sure, but the fact that it, technology will be able to talk to each other. So a fire engine, all mm -hmm. of the equipment on a fire engine will be data barcoded and therefore, we know when it needs uh, replacement, we know when it needs to go away for service, but we also know if it goes to an operational incident, the fire engine will be able to come back and it'll be self-scanned to know that piece of equipment isn't there because we've left it an incident because <coughs> it's an ongoing incident. So that kind of technology that will enable the firefighter's role to be enhanced and the safety features of all of our equipment to be enhanced. You know, on the fire ground at the moment, we already have the tablets that are really useful pieces of equipment because they provide information to firefighters in real time. So for instance, attending road traffic collisions. Now, when I were a lass, a car was a car, and you could pretty much cut up any car with uh, a pair of cutters, um, and there, were no, there was nothing that was a barrier to that. Cars now have so much inbuilt technology that we absolutely need a map of a car to understand where it's safe to make a cutting intervention, that you are not about to do things like cut through one of the enhanced safety features that might fire off an airbag or fire off a restraint system, because those in themselves actually provide a hazard and a risk to our firefighters. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so there are things like not setting off airbags, so the understanding of not triggering an airbag because the force with which they go off if you are standing in front of a casualty trying to make an intervention and an airbag were to be deployed. So absolutely understanding how that works and using the data on the, the tablet to be able to refer back to the, line, the drawings of the cars that we get supplied by manufacturers to in, see where those safety features are. Mm. So those are things that are real now, but we can only you know, look to build on those in the future. Um, you know, very much so the data about having information about premises stored on them, um, and having that tablet that firefighters can take off the back of the machine and just even having the facility where firefighters can look at it on the way to a call, whereas previously, you know, the only information was in the front cab. Now firefighters are doing that preparation. They're finding out where the hydrant is. They're looking to see where the dry rising main is and all those pieces of information that assist them with their on-arrival tactics when they get to mm. um, a call. Things in our control room. So we're looking... Uh, so um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the What Three Words app. So uh, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing, very simple app that anyone can download onto their mobile phone. And what it has done is broken the whole world up into three metre squares. So at any one point, you can click on the What Three Words app and it will give you three identifiable unique words that can identify exactly where you are. 
And I'll just say to everybody, you should get your children to download it, everyone to download it, because what it does, it means is that, so if I get my phone out now and click on what three words, it will tell me I am giraffe, yellow, buffalo. And that is a very unique three metre square. You'll be a completely different three metre square, but it means that if you are trapped somewhere, mm. and they had it recently um, at a forest up uh, north of the country, where two young girls went for a walk and got completely lost, they managed to get a phone signal, phoned up the operator, phone 999, the operator said, have you got what three words? No. They downloaded it there and then, and she said, click on the button, they said, we're this, this and this, and they were able to send a rescue team out. We've used it to identify fires where a member of the public was in the street, didn't know where they were because they weren't familiar with the area, got the what three words out, they gave us the three words, we entered it into the system and we knew exactly where they were. And that is, so it came about from um, a member of the public, apparently, who, a uh, really genius guy, who lived in an address that wasn't uh, accessible by kind of well, sat or even before that. The postal address didn't exactly direct to his house, so he was forever standing in the street waving people down for parcels and post. Um, he then worked with a friend of his who was a maths genius who worked out you only need 40,000 individual words to be able to create the permutations of three different words to cover the whole world in three metre squares. And providing you have a phone signal, you can ident get a three metre identifier uh, as to where you are. They've had people in shipping containers where people have stowed away illegally and then they've been put in places like Felix Stowe where there's thousands of shipping containers. They're then trapped in there and they had a pregnant woman and they managed to phone up, get a signal, get a what three words app and they managed to identify which shipping container they were in. Lord. So I mean, that is extraordinary. I, without in any way trying to pour cold water on something, that sounds absolutely amazing, and I'm mm. going to try it. Um, I wonder why they didn't just create an app that gave you your um, grid coordinates. So I think for, um, I think it isn't quite as interesting to young people and people like that as well, is it? I think it's the fa <laughs> part of it is the that's fascination, right, isn't it? I think if yeah. you said you could download a grid coordinator, lots of people think, yeah, why would I bother? But if you say you can download what three words and it comes up with your own three-word generator, people are far more interested. And it is about the social media appeal. Yeah, um, there's another piece of technology called 999i, which we're just looking at getting for our control room, which is brilliant for us. So what it means is uh, you're a responsible member of the public. You make a 999 call before you video the scene that you're at. And you phone us up and say, I've seen this massive fire. Uh, I'm standing outside this building, it's huge, this is happening, and um, we'll get the initial details for you and mobilise to it, but then we can say to you, are you happy to share a digital image of this thing with us? We send you a link, you click on the link, and we then the app then controls your phone, and we can see the a live video stream of what you are looking at. Yeah. So what you might call is a really large-scale fire, it might just be a skipper light mm. with lots of flames in it, mm. or it might well be a building with a fully developed fire. That enables our control operators to share the information with the ongoing appliances and instant commanders, but also it allows our control operators to increase the level of resources we send. Mm. So as you're aware, recently we've uh, allowed our control operator quite rightly to be able to make a call a person's reported if they believe somebody's trapped in a building. They don't have to wait for the instant commanders to arrive at the fire ground to initiate that. They themselves can make it a person's reported and enhance the attendance to include an ambulance and a command unit and a senior officer. So by having the control officer being able to see a visual uh, image of what the person is phoning in on, it will just make it as such a better response and then they can share that information. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that, but in connection with drones, actually, funny enough, yeah. because <clears throat> it struck me that if uh, you've got drones deployed when the fire brigade is attending, the information that the um, control staff have is significantly better because in the event of a large fire, for example, with lots more calls coming mm -hmm. in, um, the control staff are operating on the basis of a visual, a fire yeah. brigade visual. Yeah rather than uh, what could be an alarmist piece of um, spectator yeah. viewing yeah. or not. Yeah, and that's why, I mean, the, the, the 999i is so brilliant because they'll mm. have very real-time information from the person making the call. Obviously, it takes a while for our drone teams to deploy yeah. and set up, but, you know, the, we know that a large number of calls that attract huge calls, so car fires, for instance, in a prominent place will easily attract 20, 30, 40 calls. Uh, what they can do is then, so they, they, the guys who came to show us the product were talking about, you know, they've uh, had a thing where it was a, they were called to a, a car hitting a building um, and there were two people who called and given very different information and actually the car had gone right into a building to the living room of someone's house. But the first person said, oh, the car just crashed into a building type thing. So it was really able to update the crews and, you know, <coughs> recognise the significance. But for us also, specifically things like the balcony fires, um, we get a lot of calls to balcony fires because, especially on high-rise, they're so visual to people. Yeah. 
Whereas if you're able to just cut that image and have a look, you would see if it was just that one balcony on fire and the barbecue, or whether it generally was spreading up the outside of the building, causing a serious risk. Okay. So um, I'm just thinking about how much information you can get as crews are deploying. So you're getting mm -hmm. in the fire engine, you're departing the station, you're heading off. Um, <coughs> do you have firefighters in the cab looking at tablets that are giving them real-time information? Yeah. Um, I know every second counts. Um, your response times are excellent. Yeah. So what difference would it make um, having that information two or three minutes earlier than it would be if you got there? So situational awareness for the incident commander is absolutely key for firefighter safety and for our response. So, you know, we can, we now inform incident commanders on the way to an incident if there's multiple calls. So control will call up and say we're receiving multiple calls for this incident. Um, but at that point, that could still be just the car fire or just the balcony fire or a whole building on fire. Mm. So to be able to see an image of that, if we can get that data transferred to the tablets, we'll be able to, so there's a visual in the front and back to be able to say to them, this is what I'm anticipating. And then if we're, the incident commander could ask for additional resources en route and not wait till they get to the scene to have to make that assessment. That makes perfect sense. Um, tell me about the slightly wonkishly named Internet of Things, which sounds like something that somebody who doesn't know what the Internet is would say. Um, but I know it's not. So tell me about that. So I'm not an expert in the Internet of Things, I have to confess. I had to Google the Internet of Things to understand what it really was. So as I understand it, and I'm not the expert, it is about uh, devices being able to talk to a central computer point. So things like you could have a, a fire engine that has got uh, all the, incident, uh, the equipment barcoded and it could drive back through a point into the fire station and that will recognise whether all the equipment is in place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is about having those, the, uh, app, the tablets on the fire engine that are able to share data. Um, and the, you know, the limits are, there is no limit on it, is there? If you look now in our own homes, the devices like, you know, Alexas and Google Play devices that um, are listening to you all of the time, um, you know, that is the information sharing that goes on continuously, some more sinister than others, some might suggest. But um, uh, I think... using for, I suppose. Yeah, well, well and, and I think that there is, you know, the recognition people don't always uh, understand that those things are listening all the time because otherwise they can't respond to what you say. So, you know, and there have been various cases haven't there, where people have found people to be listening to people. Um, but I think for me it is, it's about balancing data. So it's absolutely right that we use our data to understand our performance and understand our response, understand our risk. But balancing the way we use data with real people because, you know, we don't have robots in London Fire Brigade, we have real people who are the ones doing a job. Yep. And yes, there might be a future where we have robots and artificial uh, people who go and do certain aspects. And there, there are aspects of robot technology now mm. that we look at. So, you know, we, there are certain fire and rescue services who have robotic pieces of equipment mm. that you can deploy into areas to well, I was going to ask you about this thing called Colossus that apparently the Paris Fire Brigade used yes. in the Notre Dame Fire. Um, I'm coming at that from a point of complete ignorance. Mm. So um, what is Colossus and how did it work? So it's a robotic um, piece of equipment that you can deploy, send forwards to not put firefighters at risk, that can uh, deploy into areas of danger and can deliver water. Um, it's a very, there are lots of pieces of equipment like it. Um, we used to have a share on a piece of equipment uh, used by the police as well for deploying into areas where they believe to be um, suspect packages and things. So it's something that's just an enhancement and development on that. Um, <coughs> I think all those have a time and a place, um, and especially where we can use technology to make firefighting safer, so where we can put an intervention in before our firefighters go into at-risk places, um, which is very good for things like industrial fires and you know, places that are where there is no life risk. But it is about also balancing our firefighters to train to do the response to save lives um, and sticking a... One of, so if you instance, look at the Lance technology, um, which many of you may or may not be familiar with, which enables us to drill a hole through a wall, uh, put a spike effectively into a, a room and spray high pressure water in there to damp down a fire. That's a very good piece of technology to enable a fire to be suppressed to allow firefighters to go in. But it is about balancing whether or not there's a member of the public in there and you could do them more harm by putting a high level of water and creating steam in there for them as well. So, you know, I think it is about getting the best technology available, mm. but using it in the right way with the right training and equipment for our serving firefighters. Because all this new stuff that is um, going to become available over the years, and it's just going to keep increasing, <laughs> um, will obviously come at a cost. Yes. Um, and, for example, the Metropolitan Police is famously or infamously 
not great uh, when it comes to investing in technology. They tend to invest money in shiny things that then they don't use, uh, or they use badly, or they bespoke too much, and then they can't replace. Um, what is going to be your approach to that? Because a lot of the stuff that we've just been talking about sounds fantastic, and it could be really, really beneficial, and everyone can see how that could be, but obviously we live in a time of contained resources. Um, the chairman is going to be coming on to talk about resourcing in more general terms in a moment. I don't want to steal his thunder. But within what parameters are you going to be working in terms of updating the technology that the, the LFB uses? So a financial envelope, um, you know, I can feel Sue glaring at me without even turning my head. Um, <laughs> she who uh, pulls the uh, finance world, because, you know, they're absolutely right, and new technology can be very expensive. And I also think there is a point to be made about not investing too early. Mm. Uh, one of the reasons we're looking mm. at doing our drones on a leasing rather than a purchase model is because things like drone technology, even since we've been doing the trial, has changed phenomenally. Um, so it is about not, for a lot of things, it's about not buying but leasing so that you can upgrade and update, very similar to mobile phones nowadays and any other piece of equipment. And it is also about not going too early because things can look like a shiny piece of kit, mm. but it is about how much use you'll actually get out of them and whether or not the value of that use is weighed off against the cost of it. So, you know, not having Gucci kit for the sake of it, but having a very justifiable reason, <laughs> firefighter safety, public safety, enhancing the role we do. Um, I think you only have to go to any one of the fire trade shows, uh, whether it be, you know, the fire show in the UK or I think the best example of that is in Schultz, the European was the biggest worldwide show. It has the most amazing technology and you could go there with a checkbook and write off millions of pounds, but at what cost against your own budget? So, you know, we don't have limitless resources, but where the technology is right and where it will provide an absolute benefit, that's when we'll do the research and look at it but not go first on a lot of these things. I think that's the issue, you know, you know, for a lot of smaller fire and rescue services, they would only need to buy one of a something and that's fine for them and they can do that. You know, London Fire Brigade, the you know, biggest fire service in England, we need to service a lot of firefighters, so we need to be careful about how we spend that money. Yeah. Okay, that's fair enough, good place to end. Thank you, Chairman. And, and just to follow on from, from Gareth's question, I mean, part of the cost of all these new pieces of kit is the cost of the staff to work them. So, for example, on the drones, I understand you're going to, if you're working a four shift system with two people for each drone crew and you're looking at three or four of them, that's about, I don't know how many, what, four, two, eight, three, four, four, six, about 30 people, you think? So that's why we are looking at, um, at different modelling resources, whether or not we put them on an existing uh, fire plants, so whether we you know, put them on our fire rescue units or something like that. So it is about how we provide that to the fire ground. Um, at the moment, we've only been deploying them to a certain level of incidents um, and on request, but there is a case to be made that they could be far more widely used. Um, and if that's going to be the case, then it's how we resource that and whether we provide a special vehicle and appliance for, to deliver that with the people or whether we incorporate it into one of our existing appliances. Uh, and that is all about balance and cost. Okay, so talking about finances more generally, um, where are we with the finances? given all the changing nature of fire and rescue services in the UK. Where are, where's the brigade? Uh, so we're currently uh, forecasting a budget gap of 20 million by 23, 24. Um, we've still got the issue around the firefighters pension and pay awards, uh, which is in excess of 50 million over the planning period. Um, it's, you know, we're still looking at, we don't have yet have a decision uh, of what the funding from government will look like in response <coughs> to the pension gap, uh, which we are hoping, I think, will be provided in December time which uh, will of course uh, reduce our gap um, and also the spending review obviously we only had the one year spending review so it depends what comes out of that going forward um, and I th we are in our normal um, budget process for 2021 we're going through the cycle of that at the moment set out in response to the mayor's budget guidance um, and that will include detailing the specific requirements in relation to um, obviously what comes out from the Grenfell inquiry. So we can't you know, presuppose what that's going to deliver. Um, we're still not sure on the timescale of when that's going to come out and what that requirement and resourcing would look like, but we have that in our mind. Um, we're using the budget flexibility reserve to meet the budget gap in full for uh, 1920 and 2021, uh, but there will remain a substantial gap over the planning period. And of course, any new areas that we identify either through things like the Grenfell Inquiry um, or the review of training that will require additional resourcing. So, Fiona, where does it come from? 
Um, well, I think, I mean, we've discussed this before. It's not clear yet um, exactly where this will come from. I'm involved as I know people from the brigade are in terms of uh, discussing with Home Office officials the sort of future pressures. Um, I was doing a lot of work through the Local Government Association uh, with, um, with the Home Office on that. And actually, um, we'll continue to do that over the next few months. We've got this one year, one year sort of rollover. But I think it's just really important that actually some of the pressures on our budget aren't simply London pressures. And actually, some of the things that come out of the Grenfell Tower inquiry will have national um, implications as well. So it's about having that honest um, discussion with government about the future needs of the. Um, of the fire sector um, on, a, on a national basis, um, as well as continuing, as uh, members will be aware, the brigade has done for a number of years to continue to push for um, the brigade to be as efficient as possible and sort of to meet those, um, the challenge that each department is, is, is set. And I think Sue could probably go into a bit more detail on that as well. Okay. So, so, Sue, I mean, just to get the headline figures, up to what year are we have we got a balanced budget? Well, we're still working through the presentation of the new four-year period that starts from 2021, but the extent to which we're balanced and how many years really hinges on what the government tries to do, does around the pensions money. So we assume, we're always really, really cautious, we assume that the money they gave us for the current year was only one-off. But the announcement for the spending review just for next year implied potentially this austerity was gentler or over and the Home Office money was going to increase in real terms by over 6%, so that you could take from that that potentially the pensions grant will continue into next year, which would, all things being equal in terms of the potential growth that we're looking at, could mean that we're in balance for 2021 and 2122, so we wouldn't be looking then at material so, savings so until the third put, year. Yeah, put the pension to one side, um, the normal costs of running the brigade, would be balanced up to 21, 22. Yeah. Uh, beyond 20, for, but for 22, 23, we've got a gap. Yeah. Of 20 million. Circa 20 million. We're still working through the figures. So the numbers that we're quoting today are based on the last things that we reported. But we had a session just on the budget only this morning. So. We it's need of, to find it's, it's of that order at the moment. The budget order, gap. Yeah. And, and the pension gap is about 50. <coughs> 50. Five zero the, the additional cost <laughs> of the actuary evaluation is around 25 million and the government gave us about 21 towards it but then we also because we do a four-year plan inflation is between sort of nine ten million a year around the assumptions we make on pay and then the indexing of the various contracts we've got so you put that all together you get in excess of 50 million but if uh, there seems to be <coughs> consensus that the brigade shouldn't get any smaller um fiona danny and steve were all of that view I presume everybody else is as well. We've got some somehow. We've got to find that extra twenty million. So how how can we find that? That feels like a genuine conundrum at the moment. So we've done, and you will know from your time on Elfie, but we've done a fair amount in the back office. Being a single purpose organisation, it's quite hard to keep shrinking support services when the the thing that you're supporting stays the same size. I don't think anybody is up for any sort of frontline reconfiguration at the moment, so it does genuinely feel like a big conundrum. Mm. But the pensions funding is very material to that, mm. so that is sort of an opportunity, potentially, for the Home Office to think about what they do with that, both for us and nationally. Mm. Oh, I don't know if you know what to add anything. Right. No, I think Susan's okay. got it. <laughs> uh, Steve? Well, just, just yeah. In terms of national funding, because this is what we're talking about, really, that the, the money doesn't exist within the organisation, but it exists within the Home Office, and it's the gift of the government to fund the fire service properly. Let's not forget, with the expanding role of firefighters in the, the, the modern firefighting and all the extra stuff that the firefighters now do within the community and in inspection and enforcement, the firefighters' pay has fallen behind drastically over the last decade. Um, we, many of our members can no longer afford to live in London, even though it's the capital city that they serve. Uh, we, we, we hear <coughs> stories back now of firefighters who are actually relying on food banks to make ends meet. So, so any kind of talk with government about funding really must take firefighters' pay into account. Okay. And is the national dispute still going on over the, the uh, uh, additional things that they were asking you to do? Yes, so the, um, 
that, that, yeah, there is a live... A corresponding and so forth. Yes. Yes, yeah, so that's, uh, that, that, that's all still live. OK. Can I just ask, yeah. are, you, are you having terrible trouble with recruitment at the moment? So, no, so our recruitment uh, level, I'm very pleased to say, we are still uh, recruiting and managing to attract people into London. But we do know that there is an increasing level of people who live outside of London because of the cost of living in London. So the lots of the people we are attracting don't live inside London and have to travel and commute in order to work here. It was always the way, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Just slightly on that, I, I think I was at the end of the other day. Where, where are we in terms of trying to find accommodation for our key worker staff in brigade pre premises? Um, Sue, so you've probably got more of an update. So, um, I mean, and thanks for your help on the um, listed building consent on that, but obviously the big the big new thing will be what we're doing at West Hampstead, which we hope to open in the, in the new year. Um, and that, we're also looking at a refresh across the whole estate of part of all the work we're doing to refurbish fire stations, look at all the single person's quarters that we've got, make sure that they're attractive enough mm. that people would want to come and, come and stay in them. But they are only single person's quarters, so we're not really offering sort of family places for people to live, so it's quite limited. But West Hampstead is the next, the next big opportunity. Mm. Good. Well, I'd like to see that finished before I retire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does anybody want to add anything that you feel we, we should have raised with you? In which case, uh, I think uh, we c we've, uh, we've come to the end. And um, can we uh, note the report of today's discussion? It should. Can we delegate authority to the chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree any output from the meeting? Agreed. And we've got a few form more formal items we need to discuss. You can stay or go as you see if it won't take long. Um, so, uh, can, item seven can we note the fire resilience and emergency planning committee work programme? And the date of the next meeting is scheduled for the 20th of November at 2 pm in the chamber. And there's no, there's no other business that I consider to be urgent. Okay. Okay.